Hello, everybody. Welcome to another webinar of the Media Education Lab. I'm very happy to have Sarah and friend here um, to share their uh, amazing curriculum that is uh, super important right now with all the crisis that is going on in the world, but with the focus on what's happening in Ukraine for the last more than two years. Um, so I'll let you take it away and introduce the Aftermath project and uh, the curriculum itself. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Yanti, for giving us the opportunity to to share and, and talk with um, the, the, your community. Um, I'm Sarah Terry. I'm a documentary photographer and filmmaker. And um, the Aftermath Project, um, I'm actually going to share my screen so you can see the Aftermath Project um, website. Uh, I'll pull this down. This is the web. This is our website. We'll show you another website for the lesson plans, but um, this began in 2007. We uh, give grants that support photographers covering post-conflict stories. And if you wanna ever go through the website, it's listed here through years. Every year we've named a finalist, um, at least one, or a grant winner, at least one, um, and four finalists. And we've done books and exhibitions um, our mission statement is that war is only half the story. And um, that is, uh, I'm just trying, so the, you can see there on my work, it's, that's where the project began uh, when I covered the aftermath of war in Bosnia um, from 2000 to 2005. And it was during that time that, um, as you all um, probably remember, that wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were um, taking off. and. All the I had moved into photography from being a print reporter um, and public radio reporter, and all the recognition and assignments and awards were going to war photography, and um, I I sort of began the work and wanted to bring others into doing the work because um, because of that statement war is only half the story because I think there's an incredible. You know, conflict reporting is so important and coverage, but if those are the only images we show ourselves about the story of conflict, like who do we become? I'm a firm believer in that what we hold up is what we become. So um, my own work was based in really wanting to understand the human spirit better, to explore the images of um, post-conflict, you know, to, understood, to understand what it takes to rebuild lives and civil societies. And... Not every photographer who's won a grant approaches it from the same perspective as I did, and that's fine. But if you go through the website, you'll see stories from around the world. You will also see um, we've been running a special five-year grant cycle called the 1419, sorry, 1492, 1619 American Aftermaths Grant. And that has been the specific grant for um, stories from the United States about the aftermaths of enslavement and colonialism. We will be having a lesson plan, you know, about that. Um, from the beginning in exploring, you know, visual storytelling, I have had a strong interest in media literacy. And my main partner in that is Fran Sterling, who you can see here on the screen. She is to my right. Um, and Fran was a senior lesson plan um, developer for Facing History and Ourselves, which is where we first met. Um, and she, after she left Facing History, she's continued working with the Aftermath Project to create these lesson plans. So I'm going to turn it over to Fran to talk more about herself and her work and how she's, these are, you will see, she'll show you the lesson plan website. We, I wanted to break the lesson plans into their own website. Um, but she will tell you more about it and we're, we'll run you through. We felt that um, Ukraine in three parts was an incredibly um, important lesson plan to be sharing right now that we really needed to be able to consider. And we're joined by Andy Cullen, who works with us on the Aftermath Project. Hi, Andy. He's a photographer as well. Sure. Um, but it's so easy to lose the thread of war. You know, when you keep seeing so many um, images of war itself, you become you can become numb or when it goes on for so long, just sort of feel like something's never ending. So we particularly wanted to present this lesson plan now with the issues that it explores from photographers who are what the first photographer represented in this group was working after the um, the 2014 revolution. So Fran Sterling, 
over to you and um yeah we're and there'll be time for questions and um this is also being recorded and um I just a note if you want to sign up to get information about when we have um new lesson plans on the website if you go to the homepage of the aftermathproject.org we can, I'll put that in the chat room there's a newsletter on that homepage we're trying to get it on the lesson plans page Fran over to you great thank you Sarah and really Lovely to meet all of you. I think we could spend the the hour just listening to each other's work, which would be fascinating. I think we all come to this um, with with uh, strong convictions and passion, and it was just really great to 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 meet all of you a, a moment ago. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm, I originally met her when I uh, was working with a Facing History in Ourselves, which is an international education nonprofit that uses history and case studies of history um, to teach moral and ethical choice making. And I came to that organization and this work really as a um, as an academic in um, Holocaust and genocide studies. That, that's my background. And I was a um, high school and middle school teacher for a number of years, then went on the nonprofit route. And now I um, primarily work in developing education content for social issue documentaries and photography projects, uh, documentary imagery in, in, in lots of different ways. So I come to this um, with um, uh, a, a real strong commitment to helping educators deal with really difficult conversations in their classrooms and how to navigate difficult histories and the visual image sometimes sitting with a visual image just a one image rather than moving images can be a very uh, thoughtful reflective exercise so when we originally started these uh, lesson plans um, it was with um, a priority to work on what we call visual literacy exercises really sitting and Sarah I think uh, has taught me a lot about what it means as a photographer to help instruct audiences about what that means. And so when we um, decided on looking at Ukraine in three parts, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we we came to an understanding that the lesson plans have grown so robust that they they that they warranted their own sorry my email is in the back there um they warranted their own uh website so while sarah shared with you the aftermath project homepage which says curriculum and lessons here that's one way to get to the curriculum lessons of of the the projects that have been chosen but what we're going to look at today is the aftermathprojectlessons.org website which looks at just select grant winners that have won over the years. And these um, get a different sort of educational treatment. We do a deeper dive into the project itself and create a whole lesson based on what that grant winner's uh, topic was. With uh, with you, what happened in Ukraine, um, Sarah, I think was quite um, wise in thinking we have three bodies of work from different periods. Uh, what's happening now in Ukraine is 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 within a context of a larger conflict that's been happening for a while there. And so just to isolate what's happening now away from what happened in 2015 or even the year before um, uh, and 2014 is is sort of not necessarily helpful for educators. So this is um, when you go to the Aftermath Project Lessons, you'll see this homepage. And as you scroll down, you'll see other projects as well, which hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to look at. But I want to take us um, really fully into the Ukraine in three parts. So before I show you, though, I want um, if everybody could um, if anybody could put in chat real quickly, because as you know, once a teacher, always a teacher, I like to be interactive. When you think of uh, a question or when you think of a, a challenge about teaching this particular moment in the war in Ukraine, what comes to mind? What do you think is most challenging for students or adults for that matter, but really for students in classrooms to understand? And I'd love just to see what you think um, is, is challenging about this particular moment in time in history. So I'll wait for folks to see how do I get my chat. There it is. Mm. Thank you, Yanti. Anyone else have challenges? 
that they can think of that Sarah and Yanti didn't bring up? Great. Mm. And Tessa, you don't have to be on camera, but if you wouldn't mind unmuting for a moment and just sharing how you navigated that challenge. Well, navigating would <laughs> imply that I came up with the solution for it. Um, <clears throat> but I remember we looked through, um, you know, it was like a New York Times, like, the Ukraine war and I don't know, a hundred photographs. And it was really oh. hard just to get them to keep scrolling. And as I, somebody else here, like why they should care, but also, um, yeah, why they should stop and look. But I, I think in my, in another class with college students, it, it was, if you can stop on singular images, as you mentioned, I think that really does kind of help slow it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. A little less, um, overwhelming. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So let's, let's dive in. Um, oh, Kaya, you meant, you, it's a really good point too, of how do you help these connections? What do you do to foster these connections? Something so far away, so distant, um, if, if that's not part of your, you know, uh, friendship group, or you don't know where Ukraine is even, um, it's a, it's a harder thing to navigate. Um, did I just, great. So I thought I just closed out the webinar there. So when you click on the full lesson plan, this is what you're going to see. Um, and what Andrew has beautifully done is translated the written context uh, of the lesson plan into a website. So when you go to download the lesson plan, you're going to see some similar information that's on this homepage. But I just want to walk you through the lesson as it appears on this website, and then you can always go back and look at the PDF. So know that that's always available. It'll look like this um, as, as a printable uh, lesson, but um, I better stay on the on the website a little bit. So here, in every in every aftermath project lesson, we put some sort of uh, rationale or context for teachers on how to use this. So this is an explanation about the uh, Russo-Ukrainian War in the present. Our challenge was how to how to really uh, tell a story of three different projects and bring some sort of cohesive thread through them. And what what is it that we can help make con those connections for students? So as you can see, and Sarah, please help me out if you can unmute yourself, if you could help um, introduce these projects a little bit. Uh, Ukraine runs through it, wounds and warscapes. I think you'll have a better sense of the background than I, and I think that might be really helpful before I dig into the, to the lesson a bit. Sure. Um, so uh, Justina's work from 2015, A River Runs Through It, was really looking at the Donbass Revolution um, and, you know, the history of the relationship between Ukraine and Russia is so um, long and so predates, you know, this, the, the, the recent, in, uh, well, two years now, invasion of um, Ukraine by Russia. <clears throat> but she was looking at the sort of historical divide of the river and who, and, and also the aftermath of the uh, 2014 um, revolution. And it was a, a, you know, the, it was it was about Ukraine's assertion of its own identity and independence. It was a just a different point in time. And then um, Joseph Svankich, um applied. It was we were judging in January of twenty uh, twenty three. So just uh, like a month before the invasion, and Joseph had applied um, with a project called um, Wounded, and he. He proposed going back to the, um, the, the those who had been injured in the 2014 revolution, and he had met so much resilience and people and people just he wanted to document that human spirit and he wanted to give hope um, to other Ukrainians to other people. He submitted his application. We got the uh, then and we were the we. It, well, I'm trying to think when we judged. We judged in March. So the invasion had happened a few weeks earlier. And um, I called him and I said, is this, because he had the strongest proposal. We were all interested in it. Ukraine just keeps coming up on our horizon. I think we've awarded more, um, you know, grant winners and finalists from Ukraine than maybe any other part of the world. And um, I said, uh, 
can you continue this project even with the invasion? And he said, I absolutely can do this. I can revisit the people, which he'd been planning to do, who've been part of this work from 2014. He goes, and there will be more people. And I want to be able to photograph that aftermath um, in, this, in this conflict. And Joseph is Ukrainian as well, Ukrainian-American. And he and his family moved to Ukraine. And I believe are, they're all still there right now. And has, he's continued covering and Matush Sorello in 2023 um, came with a super interesting proposal. You know, we're always that we're always interested in how you look at aftermath, and 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 usually when we talk about post conflict, like the war is ended. I mean, we've gave a grant for the aftermath of the Armenian genocide. You know, we've had the, the aftermath of the Wounded Knee massacre. You know, we understand that history reverberates for decades and centuries if you don't address the root causes of conflict. But we also understand that within conflict itself, there are aftermaths, like immediate aftermaths. And what Matuj was exploring was the landscape of Ukraine and the way it had been affected by war. And you saw, so, so these are, um, God, are these mines in it? There, you, you just, so yeah. it's, he's, he's looking at the built and natural environment and, yeah. and understanding what war has done to it and asking us to look. Um, these may be actually even some of the easier photographs to show students and to build around a conversation about what is would your life be like? Because the people are still living, in, you know, uh, well, actually, people are living in the whole project. I think Justina's work really also um, lends to a historical understanding of conflict and where it comes from and how it's, uh, you know, it's retained until it, there's there's resolution. But Fran, I think that's a you know a, enough yeah. of an introduction for you to like jump in with how you want to talk about using the plants. Yeah, and I also wanted to take a moment for you all to see the um, the the galleries themselves um, um, as as she was speaking about them. So um, Justine, as what what we've done with this with these lessons is we've looked at these three projects. Um, side by side and what can we help uh, students understand by looking at these three projects. So when you come into the website and you wanna see um, the, the lessons themselves, um, like I did with Sarah's explanation, you can go back to the galleries themselves. Um, you can read through the lesson as is explained on the website and then you can download it. So this is a little bit longer, but not too long. We're, we're pretty economical. Um, we give a great background in the overview of what's happened historically in this area, um, the context uh, in which the Aftermath Project awarded these, these grants, um, and that helps sets the stage more for the educator than it is for the students. Here's um, a little bit of a, a lesson objectives for the teacher about using the lesson. As it says here, um, this lesson was developed to keep the Russo-Ukrainian War in the present. In the three documentary photography essays mentioned, they cover three different years of the war and its aftermath. And we feel, as you just saw, the intimacy and immediacy that the other sources of information cannot offer. And then I'll, I'll allow you to have uh, time to read that on your own. And then we have background resources. And I think um, these have all been vetted. Um, I guess I should have said that uh, from the beginning. The photographers that are part of this project have seen this lesson, have given their, their feedback on it, have given us great suggestions. And so we have vetted it through the artists themselves in making sure that we're representing and reflecting what they would most want uh, folks to be discussing. So we're not creating something in a vacuum in that sort of way. So here, you know, we had mentioned misinformation. How do we help people understand this context? I think as a responsible educator, we always want to set the context in which we're watching these images. And we also didn't want to overwhelm. So we've given you both some visual with maps, but also just some what we what we would endorse as credible news sources, as well as um, a great class that takes a bit of a commitment. But Timothy Snyder has um, has a a, a, a a taped webinar that he teaches um, around uh, this war. And it's this one here that you can click on and it's free for you to watch. So that's not something that you could always um, assign for students at another time. And then with these three projects, um, what we ended up doing is 
breaking them down into what we call frames. Um, these can be lessons that stand alone. These can be things that you integrate into something, whether if you're a history teacher or if you're at the university level, uh, uh, specific to this region or to this conflict. And this really is the backbone of the Aftermath Project's visual literacy lessons. You will see this sort of exercise in every, um, in every project curriculum that we do. Um, so we do a describe and analyze interpret. That's that's pretty consistent with visual literacy lessons. This is something that I think Sarah, you taught me early on with your first project of from the photographer's perspective and, and from the viewer's perspective. So um, and for students, this really helps if we were looking at an, at an image, just describe literally, don't interpret, just describe literally what you're seeing, what do you think is occurring that gets them to connect with the space and time, the temporal. Um, the temporalness of the image itself. So we always start there. Then we go into the photographer's frame and, and analyze. Um, this gets more into the techniques, the, the photographer um, point of view. Uh, what are you not seeing in the frame? Uh, what are the ideas of lighting? Why this picture? What do you think is the story um, that they might be uh, wanting you to uh, think about or what feelings does it provoke? So that goes you know, to the next sort of level of, of depth. And then it's the interpretation. And this is where you could put the describe and analyze together. I don't think this is anything that folks have not done that's put on this webinar, but we slow it down. We look at the, uh, the singular image and we go through these three very um, concrete ways for students to do that. And, and then it becomes, as you do that, once you know they get a little practice, then it because, you know, becomes a sort of a natural part of the conversation in any sort of visual uh, media that they can, you can translate this, even if it is, you know, documentary um, uh, films or short films or something that's on the news, they can, they can use these skills in that sort of way. So this is a real connection to the media literacy part um, that I know, um, uh, we all sort of support, especially now. The frame two is specific then from this larger media literacy frame, we go to the frame of looking at the projects themselves as a case study of sorts. What new information about this history or the artist's point of view do we gain from this? And here, what we rely on here is the artist's statement. Um, I think we were remiss in saying that in every, in every and I guess I could just share that, in every project, I'll just pick one, one year, um, and you can, uh, you know, click on any of the projects. It'll take you to that project. There's always a, a photographer's statement with every project. That brings us into the uh, photographer's point of view. And so um, we bring that for students to look at as well. So here's Justina's statement. Um, we did um, uh, edit it a bit, but only for brevity and clarity. Um, and here's Joseph's. And here is um, Matusk. Am I pronouncing that right, Sarah? Matusk? I hope so. Um, apologies if I'm not. Um, and, and we allow students then to go back. Um, Matush. Sorry, just Matush. jumping out. I couldn't find my mute button. Matush. Okay. Matush. <laughs> um, and this, you know, the art, I, I love artist statements. I love to work with artist statements. Um, I, I think they're a really um, illuminating. Um, discussion prompt for students to look at. Sometimes they're not available. If if an artist statement is available, captions can also be a great tool to use for this uh, purpose in terms of trying to you know bring in the layers of analysis for that image. So frame two then goes into the to the photographer's point of view, and then frame three is is ways of looking at the photograph itself. So this is what um, I think we're gonna I want us to dig into a little bit more. So we've chosen here one frame, um, I mean, sorry, one image from a Ukraine runs through it, which was from the 2015 project that we introduced from Justina. And here is one image that's in this lesson. Let's see if I can, I'll just leave it here so I don't have to go back and forth. Um, try and make it a little bigger. And I can't see chat and, and look at this at the same time, but I would love, um, and maybe Sarah, you can help facilitate the conversation a little bit as I'm mm -hmm. having this. I can read story. chat while you're working great, around great. if you want to write something. Um, yeah, so what I'd love folks to do is put one or two words in, literally describe what they see in this one image without knowing anything about it other than what's at the top there, the project that it comes from, the date we've told you. Um, and that here is a Father Vladimir image. That's all you know. So there's there's some clues there about what it is, but literally what do you see going on? 
and just write a few words down in chat what you see. Hmm. Are we good to go to the next one? Oh, there I see. I got it going now here. Great. Oh, Fran, I'm sorry. Do you want me to read the okay, comment? No, no, no. no I'm, I'm looking. I see that some of you, <laughs> I think it's a natural inclination to sort of do what you see in terms of what you think it is. Um, and and it's a hard it's a hard uh, sort of a boundary to set like what you literally see. I, I see some people think it's you know they, they mentioned some of the little some moved into the interpretive, which is fine. Um, I'm going to ask that the next question. Um, we're not going to be reading the artist statement here. So, uh, but I think this is always an interesting question uh, to ask when you're looking at a singular image with the aftermath project is. What do you think is going on around the frame that we're not seeing? What is going on around the frame? What is next to perhaps the woman? What's on the other side of the building? What are we not seeing um, that you might and think? And Fran, are you able to read the chat messages now? Or do you I want am. to read them out loud, yeah. which I didn't do? <laughs> no, it's okay. No, I'm good. I can. Okay. I read them all. I was going, oh, good answers. And then I realized you couldn't see them. No, it's fine. It's all good. So what's going on around? What are we not seeing? I love that question so much. I teach it all the time. I know we've discussed it from early on. I know I, we discussed it early on with the teaching I did with Facing History Absolutely. back in the day. It was like, what can't you see here? Because, you know, it's important, I think, in, in, the, um, in the teaching to understand that a photographer has a, literally has a point of view. And it's what you see in the frame. And that's part of literacy, right? That's something that's been chosen by the photographer. Um, there is potentially as much bias in a photograph, you know, as in a, a written word for what you choose to keep out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, vacant lots. Other interesting answers, vacant lots. And it's interesting, um, Kaya, you, you made the leap, which I think is a very natural leap that because of the context in which this photograph sits, situated. It's, we know it's within the aftermath project. We know it has to do with war. We bring our understanding of what's on the outside of this frame already to the picture. Um, if we did not know that this was Ukraine, if we did not know this was a war, um, we might have a very different um, ideas about what's going on around it. And I think that um, interpretive um, need that we do of like placing something in its context is, is a very natural thing but it's really interesting if you take if you strip it all away and you just show this to students without telling them exactly or telling giving them any information about what this is how different the conversation would be and I think that this is sort of the layer of the media literacy that we bring into what we try to bring into the aftermath as we try and layer the context of the of the conflict, we we try and layer it with both background and context, but we also try and layer it with multiple images from the photographer's point of view of their interpretation of what uh, what aftermath is and in, in where they are, depending on their identity, depend on you know lots of different factors. Brianna, you know, I would just toss in there as well. But if you completely strip your context for the, this image, you, we don't you, you you know not Ukraine not. Um, war, not post-conflict, um, it actually is a hope, it could be a hopeful image. Do you know, like it's it's a sunny day, right? That's something we've discussed before and it's one of the questions. What's the impact of light and shadow? So there's light. And I think Yanti, you asked if it was 
construction or destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is a community that's building a brand new church and this is the these people have just moved into the community and wanted to get their baby baptized or uh, you know there's there's so many ways that you can just have um, super free conversations about the impact what time of day is it? Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. guess it's either late morning or like mid afternoon. I know what light does, you know? So I think those are lots of ways to explore it. And I think somebody brought up trying to place the window in the wall. Yeah, That's Tesla did, super yeah. good detail and question to be considering. It looks like an old window. So, you know, like why would that be? And why would it be in that location? That's not yeah. where a window normally sits. Do you know those are these are just I mean this is sorry I'm I'm jumping in on this because I love you asked great questions. I'm like oh so interesting yeah thank you you guys have some wonderful wonderful um, comments here and feel free to uh, you know unmute yourself if you want to add anything that you don't feel like typing um, and I think Sarah the idea of of really juxtaposing it with the emotion of hope versus destruction. Um, really is a, uh, can kind of, I think, give people pause, like, how can, how, how would you find hope in this moment, but yet, and yet, they are, or, and yet, life continues, and yet, religious, uh, the need to have blessing, the need to have connection to faith continues, and I think that, um, I know you can speak much more about that spirit of what happens in aftermath is something that's often not spoken about. What is the resilience that people bring? How do people endure? How do they rebuild community? Um, and how how can that be a convers? How can that be as much of a conversation um, about conflict as the conflict itself? How do we bring that humanity back into the conversation as both prevention, but also as a, as a sense of um, as like the tagline is: "War is only half the story." The rebuilding is as much, if not more, than the story. Um, because people do. And I think um, this, this I found, I picked this picture because I, I found it hopeful um, in the midst of, of the war. Um, so that's sort of a second step of we looking at like what's outside the frame. And then here's the caption um, that I didn't want to share, um, but I'll, I'll read it um, as, as much as I can, right? Here's uh, Maripol, which now we know current conflict uh, might have different resonance for us than it did in 2014 when this fit photograph was taken. Um, I'll let you all read it um, instead of reading it aloud, but I'll pick out a few things. You know, here we have services in Ukrainian language while Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow uses old church Slavonic. So we're already learning that this is a different, this is um, uh, at odds with the Russian church. They're continuing um, their faith in, in the midst of, of being... Uh, being in war. Um, the, the father talks about um, his own point of view um, and as, as does the photographer. So after you read the caption. Um, also, just to note the river Dnieper, which I'm not saying correctly, that's the river that is so historic and so important and goes throughout Ukraine. Um, and it's what it, it, uh, Justina's project follows the course of the river. And of course, uh, as you mentioned, friend, you know, <clears throat> if you really, you know, if, the, if you were teaching war as opposed to just post-conflict, this would be a super interesting thing to consider this project and this photo in the light of um, 20 Days in um, Mariupol, which yeah. won the Oscar. Um, and that film is actually made by a photographer um, as to what has happened since, since that time. Um, and, I, and I believe, Sarah, the, the river itself was a, a somewhat of a dividing line. Yes. Of yes. Community. Yeah. Yeah. So um, any thoughts about the, the caption and how it informs your understanding of this picture any differently? Anybody want to unmute themselves and, and share? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but. Yeah, As you can tell, Fran and I can talk forever and are easy, and great conversation with each other. So we'll give you space to like yeah. to jump in. Yanti, you smiled. Can I put you on the spot? Did you have a thought? No, you were just smiling. Okay. Great. I so, as, oh yeah, please. Oh, uh, just as, as Sarah mentioned earlier about the message of hope, I definitely get that more when I see that caption um, because it's talking about the construction of a church. So it, it, it does 
become a bit brighter for me. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Thank you for sharing that. And, and you can consider the effect of the sunlight and the time of day on it, you know, on that hope. I mean, uh, that is just an interesting thing to break down in terms of visual literacy, that use of light and where it is. And I think it's also super interesting just to toss out there how the photographer has chosen to frame this photograph. Like, why is the action, why is the baptism on the far left of the picture? Is she trying, does she really want to show us that, um, so there's the water bucket, I'm guessing the red bucket. Um, there's also the issue of how color has helped, how red runs through this picture, how it frames it. But um, she's she wants us to see that window on the right hand side. That's a super important thing to make note of. She wants us to see that. That is such a conscious decision about the framing of the photograph. It's There's some meaning for her there between the relationship of that wall and that window and this new life um, or this act of hope, uh, act of faith that's happening to the left, which also opens up a whole other thing. Oh, it's an act of faith. You know, what does it mean to be in a post-conflict situation? What kind of faith does that take? And not even religious faith, but what kind of faith in the human spirit? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Not to interrupt, but obviously there's so much to dig yeah. into. And that's true for every photograph, right? And also yes. the absence of, of the absence of a roof, the yes. absence of the, the the juxtaposition with nature there as well. And and specifically showing a window with no roof, with sunlight, and 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 the poetic sort of lyrical nature of that as well. So yes. great. All right. So as this this and this is just one lesson of this project and each, not every uh, photography project has it, but um, a, a large um, segment of the grant winners each have something not as extensive as this, but look at a visual literacy aspect of that project in a different way. So you could spend um, much more time. It's not just the same lesson over and over again um, in terms of uh, what you look at. Um, so the other two projects um, that we have as part of the Ukraine in three parts, as we mentioned, is wounds and warscapes. And wounds and warscapes have a little bit of a different exercise here. We we allow uh, for wounds the the students to choose now that they've had this practice of of looking closely um, and going through the steps of visual literacy. They then pick their own image from wounds and um, to remind you um, of this project. Um, you can come here. And this one takes you to the photo, the photo gallery. As Sarah explained, this was, um, I find this project a, a harder one emotionally for me to, to, to look at. Um, and so we allow students to choose one of these images, um, whichever one they wanna to work through um, um, in, a, in a similar way uh, with the idea that, um, a lot of things open here. Once they choose their photograph, then they do a similar exercise of, you know, what is this uh, particular photograph um, illuminate for them around healing, around recovery? What, how does this story tell the story of war differently than, than um, the previous photograph? Um, and then also doing a next question that we haven't yet talked about, which is the titling uh, of the projects themselves and, and how does that uh, offer another frame to to a photograph, the the projects, the whole project, not each photograph, and then we do a a, a third exercise in this lesson uh, with warscapes. Um, again, they get to choose any image. They read the caption underneath it, and then they go deeper into the questions. And this is the sort of three frames that we bring to trying to understand three different time periods of what happened in Ukraine uh, and what's happening in Ukraine. And so um, I think that gives you a, a sense of the depth of this. Also, you know, I, I asked you about the challenges um, from the get-go because this is challenging. Um, you know, this is this is a challenging topic to to bring up with students. Um, it's there's a lot of context that has to be understood in order for um, the, in order for misinformation not to be perpetuated. So um, we wanted to keep it um, distilled enough for you to then connect with uh, particular communities at particular moments of time and look at Ukraine over the span of time. So I'm gonna stop here for uh, a, a minute because I realized um, we've been sharing uh, quite a bit. Um, I wanna return for a moment 
to the um, Aftermath Project lesson website. And I wanted to spend a few minutes just sh showing you. Um, and again, Sarah, if you want to, you know, if you want to pitch in um, the other lessons that we have, you can just I just wanted you to see the difference in lessons. And, and Andrew, certainly, if you'd like to, to say anything as well, because I know you've spent a lot of time with these lessons um, that they just give you a different sense of hidden scars. Again, the, the photographer's statement, the lesson plan. Um, here is nationals and war in Chechnya is the focus. Um, and then it gets into uh, different ways of seeing, again, visual literacy, but uh, not as long, not as extensive, um, but gives you a different um, exercise for students. So whether I know somebody who had to hop off, they're going to show this to their photography teacher, uh, of course. Um, as a history teacher, um, I would recommend and I would really endorse using these in history classes, uh, social yep. studies classes, uh, geography classes, and, and whatnot. I think this is a really wonderful addition to that. Um, kind of curriculum. Stanley, just a po uh, who's passed, um, covered the war in Chechnya and then won this grant for doing the aftermath. He's one of a very few people, photographers I'm aware of, who've covered the aftermath of a conflict they covered. It's very different ways of seeing. It's very hard to do. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful um, project. Yeah. American Memory, I highly recommend as another project um, looking at from the American history standpoint. Um, we did, a uh, Andrew Lichtenstein is a uh, really interesting photographer who did a project of looking at moments in American history where unless you know the context of what that image is, you don't necessarily know what's happening. And um, Sarah knows that this is one of my favorite photographs of his. Mm. Yeah. Is, um, I just have to find it. The so one at the bus stop? Yeah, the bus stop. Yeah, it's a phenomenal photograph. It stopped everybody cold. This one. Can I say what it is? Please. So actually, yeah. uh, just take one moment. This is super fun. Does anybody have without reading the caption? Does anybody have an idea of what this is a picture of? And I know we've been going for a while. So um, sorry, the caption might be peeking out there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is. Um, these women are in Confederate dress. They have just come from um, a celebration of um, the, gosh, I think it was 150 years after the inauguration of Jefferson Davies, Davis. Mm -hmm. um, and they have just taken a break and they've come and they've sat down on the bench where Rosa Parks got on the bus to end, you know, help launch the civil rights movement. So the the layering of history here is just so phenomenal. And it's something that a photograph, Andrew's photos really also need the captions to accompany them, but they're super interesting to explore without that information first. Yeah. Yeah. And each of these, um, yeah, all of them are a space where something happened in American history that, that yeah. involved issues of, uh, colonialism, enslavement, violence. And America conflict within the American landscape in that way. Yeah. Yes. Um, and here, reclaiming the dead uh, uh, conflicts in, in Guatemala. Um, the most important picture, I think it was, is it, um, who was working with, Maureen? Um, I think you brought up working with um, refugee issues. Is that right? Um, well, I'm doing some, a project that, that kind of covers it. Okay. That might be helpful. Yeah, this might be a very interesting project because uh, and Brendan Bannon worked with young people, Syrian refugee students in uh, refugee camps and gave them cameras and um, walked them through some, some photography workshops for them to capture their own experiences as refugee students in Syri as Syrian refugees. And so these are um, students photograph, you know, students photographs yeah. of their experience. Um, <laughs> I, I just could you uh, could you type in the chat what this site is? It looks like a you're you're comparing this to your project or a different. No, project? this is. Thank you for clarifying. No, this is. So uh, this is a grant winner of the aftermath project. The most important picture was the project that won that year. I think it was two thousand. What year it was, was it? A special <laughs> grant they got to support. Yeah, I things. do love your website has a lot of great mapping features, timeline features. And I wonder if you could speak to how you've constructed it so beautifully. And if you could put in the chat, the American 
project. I missed it. Uh, the name of it. Sure. I'll do that, Sarah, if you want to talk Thanks about the so timeline. Much. Sure. We worked with a really wonderful website developer and spent a small fortune. This is not a square space, you know, sort of easy to do from the back end website. Um, we wanted um, the Aftermath project has now become one of the longest running and, and most important photography grants in, in the documentary photography and photojournalism world. We wanted you to always have a sense of the timeline of the work. Um, and we wanted you to understand where in the world uh, we were because we named one or two grant winners and then three or four finalists every year because each year uh, the judges are essentially saying, this is, this is what aftermath looks like in our world today. So uh, to tell you the specifics of how the website was built, I can't do that. Um, I'm happy to put you in touch with a person who, who designed the website. Um, but that was one of the largest expenses I think we've ever had. We have mm -hmm. lists of the, all the photographers at the bottom. There's different ways to scroll through it. The grant application, as you see, we have our um, American Aftermath grant cycle is open right now. There's our newsletter. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is there? And then we were also, Andrew is doing a wonderful job auditing the website. Over the years, we realized some things got left off of certain pages. So we're doing a big revamp of um, making sure everybody's statement is there, et cetera. And, you know, the story is about how it came to be. We'll update that. Um, yeah, but it's it's meant to be a site that lives for a long, long time and uh, does something to address the, uh, the other half of the story of war. Yeah. Also, by the way, on lesson plans, uh, I think I mentioned Fran will be doing one for um, the American Aftermath grant, but she's also working on one that I've given her, I'm making her stretch on about um, poetry and photography. Our 10th anniversary book, I'm going to put it here in the map. You can find it. Um, it's online. It's for sale. Uh, it is called War is Only Half the Story. I'm putting this in the chat. And it's published by Dowie Lewis. I have it right here. Oh, good. Show it, Fran. Um, maybe unshare your screen so they can see it. Oh. Just because it's a little in the box and I just love the book. And it is, um, that book is, it's another exercise in visual literacy, actually. It's a pretty fascinating one um, because, oh, Fran, there you go. I'm going to unfocus. I'm gonna, um, what about your face, oh. Fran? Because yeah. you're, there you go. Um, the, uh, we use the poetry of Wisława Szymborska to create the chapters in the book. So they're not by country or by project or by grant winner. They are, are sequenced to her poetry, um, which includes one of them, one of my favorites in there is the third chapter, which says, perhaps all fields are battlefields, those we remember and those that are forgotten. And that entire chapter draws from 10 years of our history and puts those images in place there. But those are, um, that might be something uh, also to just to compliment um, your work. Um, and now, you, oh, and there goes Fran's cat as we were discussing. I'm sorry. <laughs> that should be coming through soon. Should we, we're, there's, we're, you can see there's lots to explore. Should we make room for questions, Fran, or do you want to, is there? Oh, I'm finished. Okay. Thank you. I always, boy, Fran Sterling is one of the smartest people I know. I'm always super interested to hear her talk about literacy and intelligence and thinking and teaching. Any, any questions from you all that we could help with or? Hi, thank you. I have a question. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your your presentation. And I'm struck by how beautifully those lesson plans and the website are created. It's very uh, satisfying to see and I really enjoyed it. Uh, so my question is, have you made any considerations uh, when you make those lesson plans, given that, you know, some students, uh, like some some teachers teach in a very diverse, you know, classrooms, and you know when it comes to conflicts and war, mm -hmm. uh, and I I study mis and disinformation, so that becomes very you know sometimes politically divisive or politically charged, and you know some teachers feel like they have to like always walk on a you know tread on eggshells because mm -hmm. you know there are like people students who might have very different points of view. 
um, and I didn't feel like your uh, lesson plans were, you know, like getting into issues that, that are like very divisive. Like I think it's very well made, but I just wonder if you have, you know, like a general like ideas or like if you made any considerations in terms of that you know, kind of avoiding or like yeah. dealing with that kind of situation. Yeah, no, I think you bring up, um, I mean, even the the Rosa Parks Confederate bench photograph, the stuff about the, the Ukrainian war, depending on your home life, depending on geography of where you live, that would have a different resonance. Um, and not just a photograph, it, it tells a story of something, a narrative of our country or of another's country that has perhaps a very much uh, a personal um, impact on you. I think in the lessons itself, there is a frame that these are uh, a moment in time. This is a historical, an image is a historical primary source document that tells a moment in time and it tells its story. The, cl the context that we build around that I think is really important. And the resources that we suggest, we try and have as, um, as nonpartisan issues as possible as as you can in in media but you know and, and bringing up that idea of point of view of what is the photographer's the artist statement is I think a super important part of that because what you're doing is you're inferring for students you're you're suggesting and then you're literally giving them this is somebody's point of view of this conflict of this history. This is not my point of view. This is not my president's point of view. This is this artist's point of view. Um, and as we honor that, as we uh, interrogate it, as we analyze it, that's that's the lens that we're bringing to this, um, is the artist's point of view and interpreting that. Not And if students do the interpretive of like, well, that you know, offends me or whatever, then that's, of course, you can have the space for that. But you're always coming back to this is a moment in time of a photographer who's telling a story from a particular point of view. And that bias, that reading of bias is really what we can translate into other things. So I, I'm really glad you brought that up. I, I also want to bring in, I don't know if you were mentioning this, though, I think the trauma aspect is a um, and, 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 you know, whether it's a, 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 tr a trigger for some folks, some students or some educators, I think is um you know, when we started doing the lessons, the conversation um, I don't think was as robust as it is now in schools around uh, trauma-informed care of, of um, professional development for educators around trauma-informed care. And I think that's something that we could do better in this and that we would like to add as a frame of when you're, when you're talking about war and conflict at any time, there's always a sensitivity to it that you need to be both transparent with and also allow students to leave the room um, or take care of themselves in the way that they need to. So thank you for bringing that up. We can add that. We can add it on the website. We could yeah. add just a note at the very top. But also, Kyle, I wanted to just share, it's a bit of a story, but I think it's a really interesting point about photography and that issue of um, how it's interpreted. I was training some of the Facing History and Ourselves teachers about how to use the lesson plans in their classrooms. And I was in South Africa. I was in a school that had been um, white under apartheid and was now a mixed school. And we were having a conversation. Um, I would show my own post-conflict work and I can't remember how we got into this space, but one young white student in the in the classroom was was pretty disruptive and uh, was talking about violence. And he just, he, he clearly was having a hard time with, I mean, South Africa, most any South African, I think will tell you they've done a good part with the truth telling, they haven't gotten to reconciliation yet. So they, these young students were aware of it too. So I stopped the class and I said, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have you do the photography exercise that I had planned for this class. And I think we're gonna go ahead and do it now. I said, you have an hour to go around the school. It might've even been a half hour of their lunch break. And I said, you're gonna make two photographs, you know, on your iPhone. One will be a photograph of the friend and the other will be a photograph of the enemy. And you, you're gonna come back and we're gonna look at them and you're not gonna, you're not gonna tell which one is which. We're gonna let people look at your images. And there came a point where we looked at this image of a bicycle um, gear circle, like a very, it was beat up. You could see just a little bit of bike around it. It was scarred, it was dented. And, and you could see kind of the oil and the chains, they were dirty and they were spiky, right? And so the conversation was like, 
well, no, I think it's the friend. Like, how do we even talk about this? Like, but we, I would ask the students, what's this picture make you feel? What do you understand about it? What's, what, what's outside the frame? We were talking about all those things. And there was one colored student, colored meaning, you know, the uh, Asian, a Asian, I'm not black, colored and white in South Africa. And there was a colored student who rose that rose was listening to the conversation and he just, I could see he had something to say. I said, what do you think? And he said, I think it's the enemy. And um, I said, well, why is that? And he said, look at the spikes. It could hurt somebody. And I knew where the girl was who'd taken it because she was like kind of like falling apart on the other side of the room with wanting to talk about it. And he said, that looks dangerous to me. And of course it would if you come from a, any culture of where you might have been the subject of abuse or torture or that's part of your community language. And this girl was waving her arm and I said, why don't you tell us what the picture is? I know you took it. And she said, it's the friend. She said, the bike is South Africa. She said, we're battered and dented, but it, it still works. The chain works and it's going to take us on the road to reconciliation. And I just like, I, it was just such an amazing, and so I could say to the students, do you understand how a photograph isn't right or wrong? It's a, it's a place where you can have a conversation and people can bring, and because it's so emblematic of the, like everything, right? To any situation, we all bring our histories, who we are, how we see it, what it was. And if you could create a space where you don't, somebody's not automatically right or wrong, mm -hmm. but it's like, this is how I perceive it. it. It it creates a whole nother dialogue. And I think if you can guide those conversations in a classroom, and I think photographs help you do that, unlike almost any other form of, of you know, storytelling or information. But um, I've just always loved that story because because it, it just I've, I've often said, boy, let me into a corporation. If they're having problems <laughs> with communications, I can get them sorted with photographs, you know, with making photographs. <laughs> It's a, you, you've got a really good point. And Fran's answers were great too. And Andy and Fran, let's just add that note at the top, you know, that's just discretionary note or whatever. Um, but yeah, um, super good question, Kyle. Thank I'm, you. I'm yeah, super fascinating and beautiful story. And I, I never really considered using visuals of photographs in, you know, media literacy or misinformation, disinformation classes, but I now see, you know, that like it might be like a really good tool if mm -hmm. I can use it wisely. So yeah, thank you so much for the inspiration. Oh, thanks for what you're teaching. Yeah. Thank you both for offering. We're at the end of the hour, but really finishing with that powerful story. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know I was doing a lot of work in nonviolence communication. I always use popular culture, visual motion picture to really bring it like home um, and have the discussion from the personal experiences and understanding the differences of interpretation. So thank yeah. you so much, Sarah and friends, and thank you for everybody. Great. Thank you for the, the and... opportunity. And I'm just going to throw in one PS is that the Aftermath Project website itself will have almost any country or any region of the world that you may be teaching something on. And it's a great resource, even if there isn't a lesson plan yeah. you know, to go use. What, the lesson plans will teach you how to use the website. Oh. And you can, yeah, they're great models. models. And I so. put my, I just put my email there. I know we're out of time. I put my email there. Feel free to reach out. Sarah, I didn't know which email you would want to put out. Sounds amazing. I'll put mine so here. I'm happy to support. If there's any project that's on this that you would like to have a more in-depth conversation on, I'm happy to uh, talk. Sarah certainly knows the projects much in much more in-depth, but the ones that have lessons associated with, I've dug in pretty deeply and I can, um, you know, again, they're models, they're blueprints for you to adapt. They're not, uh, you know, A to Z kind of lesson there for you, for you to, to play with and adapt as you, as you so fit. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Really wow. great. Thank time. you so and much. And you'll, sh you'll share the link to the recording yes. with us. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Super wonderful. Uh, thank you all for being such good listeners and letting us, I love talking to Fran, as you can tell. But thank you, Yanti, for the space and all of you for the work you're doing. We, we'd be happy to be in touch.